Awesome. Welcome. Thank you so much for uh, joining me for this session. I know there are a lot of good tracks, so big thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and this thing doesn't work. That's off to a good start, isn't it? I have this uh, clicker which I don't hold in my hand because of UX problems. I can't handle having something in my hand because I will, for some reason, clap like a seal. So I have a, a ring presenter instead. But now it works. So uh, let's get started. How many of you have ever used a system or an app or a page that has been a little bit too slow or a little bit too complicated? Yeah, almost every one of you. That is my case as well. How many of those were internal systems? <laughs> Basically the same amount of, yeah, exactly. I have an example of that as well. Um, I am a consultant and sometimes when I consult, I have to use my client's time report system to, to report my time, uh, like some of you probably have as well. So I go to this page, I have tried to blur it out so you don't see who it is. But, well, yeah, trying to be a little bit nice. If you know the page, I probably, you probably can see what it is. But I go to this page and I log in and I press, click, uh, I click on, on uh, time report, report my time. And I'm redirected to this page where I have to log in. Now, if you listened, you know I've already logged in once, right? So I have to log in again because you can't remember that when you change pages, right? Well, you can. Then I'm taken to this third page, which has a completely different design, not even the same colors. I, um, well, there might be some blue over here, but it's a completely different page. And yet again, I have to click on uh, report my time. It's like they don't even listen, is it? And I'm going to the, this page where I have to log in Again, this is number three. <laughs> this is the third time. And this is also one of the first time I had to call support for help. Because what they've done is, this is a company who, uh, who exists in, in uh, many countries, and what they have done is this login differs from the other two. But they call it the same login, but you have to omit the first two uh, letters, which is SE from Sweden. Or, or for Sweden or US from the America and so on. But there was no information about that. So I actually had to call support to be able to log in to report my time. And now I'm taken to the final page where I can actually report my time. So five different pages, even though I clicked report time the first time, which is, well, interesting. This um, process takes me about 16 to 17 seconds. I have timed this many a times. Uh, to be sure that it's actually this slow. Now, if we do this a little bit more efficiently and actually take you to the report time from the first click and, and log in, it would have taken, what, one second? Let's say two to be nice. So that will save me 15 seconds every single time I have to report my time. I am impatient, I know that, and I know that this does not sound like much time, 15 seconds, I mean, come on. But if we use this system every day, if we use this system every single day for a month, that's five minutes of my time spent on redirecting five times every single time. Still doesn't sound like much. Five minutes, that's like a bathroom break, right? Nothing. But imagine you're a company and you have to log into this uh, system or use this system three times per day, or you have three different systems. That's not uncommon either. And we're a medium-sized company. We're 200 people, and all of a sudden, this comes to 600 wasted hours every year. 600 hours on nothing, on redirect. All of a sudden, it's not about my experience anymore. All of a sudden, this is about the companies wasting money that they could have learned, earned for, for use for something else. Just take that number and, and multiply that with whatever you are earning per hour. This is a lot of money. My name is Jessica Engstrom. I'm a Windows Development MVP. I run a company called Awesome Dev because we love puns and writing things that people cannot read, so AZM or Awesome. 
we work with Windows development and fighting for a better UX. That is my mission in life. But we also work with all the cool stuff like bots and HoloLens and AI and things like that. I'm also the co-host of a podcast and we have actually a podcast on this subject if you're interested, so uh, I can recommend that. Does anybody recognize this book? Yeah, a few of you. Mm -hmm. This is a best-selling UX book by a cognitive scientist and a usability engineer, those titles, uh, Donald Norman. This is a really good book. But there's a funny thing about this book. When it came out, it was called The Psychology of Everyday Things, not The Design of Everyday Things, which, funny enough, allegedly had his, his own UX problems. And I'm not talking about the book. The book is good. But what happened was that the bookshops put, them in, put this book in the psychology department, which means if you come in and look for a design or a UX book, you couldn't find it. So they had to change it. I don't, I'm not sure how true this is, but this is how, what I have um, gathered for, for, for this. So it makes sense this title because there are a lot of psychology into uh, UX actually. But this isn't the only book out there on UX. There are a lot of books, thousands of books, thousands of really, really good books. Um, we have for at least 100 years research for, on, on user interfaces and, and user experience. Granted, in the beginning this was not towards software interfaces. This was for, for everyday objects and, and other things. But surprisingly um, enough, um, is the same thing for everyday objects to software UI. So there are a lot of things overlapping here. There are also a lot of studies out there that is really, really good. But the question is, how in the world are we going to be able to read all those books? How in the world are we going to be able to read all those studies? And how in the world are we going to make sense of it all? In development, there are a lot of conventions that we could or should uh, be able to use uh, or follow, if you will, like um, the solid principles. We have boiled everything down to one set of rules or principles. And the same is actually true for UX as well. We can do this. Um, for, the question is, should we read all those studies and books as developers? Do we have the time for that? No, mostly, mostly not. This is Michael Medlock and Steve Herbst. Uh, these are the guys who used to work for Microsoft UX research team. Awesome guys, I have the fortune to actually sit down with them and they are also on the podcast I talked about earlier. Um, they realized that there are a lot of information and they also realized that it is very hard to retain all that information and they work with UX, but they also thought that there are a lot of ways to, to do that. And the problem that they saw was that there were so many different vocabularies out there. So all the books are really, really great, but they are talking different languages, which means it might be hard to, to actually talk to another UX person or another uh, developer who, who have read another book. And, and sometimes they were, the words were a little bit fluffy, if you will. Not their words, my word. Um, some wants, uh, wants it to feel intuitive, but how do you code a feeling? If you know how, please call me. I would love to know. Uh, I, I've also heard uh, designers coming in and say, like, this button, I want it to feel like a summer wind. Yeah, how do you code a summer wind? There is no intelligence for summer winds. So yeah, there's that. So they took all this information that they could find and they tried to analyze everything. And what were all the books saying? What were they really trying to convey? and all the studies and all that, and they boiled it down to a system called Tenets and Traps. And th that's uh, what I'm going to talk about it today. Now, Tenets and Traps is a tool that Microsoft is using internally to catch all those pesky UX traps. Granted, not all is catch caught, 
Uh, but other companies as well are starting to use this system like Facebook, Oculus, Google, and, and um, I think even Apple or Amazon is on uh, tenders and traps as well. So today we'll be based on that system. A deck of cards, a systematic approach to UX. So my goal with this talk is to show you that you can rock your UX without reading all those books, without reading all those studies, and without being a UX specialist. Sound good? Awesome. So what is tenets and traps? Do we have any Doctor Who fans in here? Awesome, this one's for you. Oh, so many, I love you guys. For those who can't make sense of these images, after NDC, go home and watch Doctor Who. Okay, good. Unfortunately, it's not that tenet, it's tenet. And a tenet describes general attributes about good interface design. So all the good stuff we want in our UX. And the traps describe common problems uh, with UX that degrades this goodness that we want to have. Reduce the traps and the tenets or the UX will improve. It's simple as that. Tenets and traps are also related to each other. So all the tenets have um, traps that will degrade it. So everything is connected here as well. For example, if someone says about your app that it's slow or, or doesn't respond, the trap will be slow or non-responsive and it will degrade the tenant responsive. And this is the card for it. So up here, I know it's a little hard to, to read if you're in the back, but up here it says responsive. So this is a tenant. Here it says a trap is slow or non-responsive and you can also read a description of what that means. And the, the really good thing is if you flip the card, you will have a, an example of what slow or non-responsive is, a real life uh, example. So that is really, really clear. So this system has several strengths. Um, one, it's the essence of all those good books and, and research that has been made. Uh, another is also that it separates the positive attributes from the negative one. So you not only will know why, well, that you have a problem, but you will know why as well, because sometimes you know that something is wrong with this one, but I don't know why, or I don't know what. But this will explain all of that, which is why I love this so much. And it's also very easy to understand because it uses clear English. There is no summer winds to be found here. <laughs> no fluff at all, plain English, which we will have so much easier uh, conversations with, um, about afterwards. There are a total of nine tenets, so nine good things that we strive for. And all of the tenants has at least one trap. Some of them have even more. Like, for instance, um, understandable. It has uh, eight different traps. And I will not go into all the traps in, in, uh, in this deck, but I will go through all the tenants and some of the traps, uh, because there basically is no time to, to go, go and talk about everything. So it has eight traps. Eight things that will degrade understandable. Eight things that will make your user, un, uh, user experience less understandable. Basically eight things you should avoid. So before we dive into looking at the cards, uh, let's talk about how you actually work with this. How would you work with this? So first of all, you identify a task uh, that you want to, to uh, test out. Uh, the most, most important thing in your app. So if you are Instagram, we will uh, look at how to post an image or how to share a picture uh, to Instagram. That's the main focus, right? So you can do that in different kinds of way. You can either take up your camera uh, on your phone and, and take a picture and share it to Instagram. You can open Instagram and, and take a picture from there. You can go into your gallery or image gallery, I should say, and share it to Instagram and so on. So there are different ways to perform this task. So we walk through every single way we can perform that important task. Then we identify and log all the traps that we find. And we do this by having someone else try your, your app or this function out, preferably not someone who is developing this. I know 
that sometimes we don't have the means to, to actually have a real testing group and, and things like that, but have your mom test it. My mom is the best tester, I, I kid you not, she is. So have someone test it. Uh, it's okay if it's someone in, on your team if you don't have the, the means to it. It's better to test it uh, than not, of course. Have them think out loud. So have them say, they will feel a little bit awkward in the beginning, but have them say what they're thinking, like, I don't see any button, or oh gosh, this is uh, so slow, or fast for that matter. And then you go through, you look at the cards and they say something about slow, then you see, oh, slow or non-responsive. You take that card and you put it to the side. And then you continue, listen to what they're saying. And because it's plain English, it's very easy to translate into the cards. So you do that, you log all of them, and then you report if you are more than one, which I highly encourage, you can just take turns. That, that is a, a viable option. So you can actually report and discuss around this, what, what was going on. Did you have a trap that I didn't, and so on. Sometimes I know we can't do this, but optimally we will. Um, there we go. Now, Can we always use this system? Is this the magic bullet? Of course not, but it nearly is. There are a few exceptions. You can actually use this if you are, are doing physical object as well. Uh, it does not, it, it's not only for, for software user interfaces, it's for everything. But if you have a shopping app or you have a game, you will have a little bit more leeway because if you have a game, you don't want to come to level 100 with one button click, right? You don't want that. You want it to be a little difficult, so you have a little bit more leeway. Same, same, same thing with, with um, sales apps or, or, or store apps and things like that. There are a lot of psychology behind why you, you are seeing the same object uh, or item everywhere in, in the UI, and that is a trap in, in this context, but not if you are a shopping app. That's the whole thing. You want to sell things, right? Uh, so you have to use your common sense here. That is what I'm trying to say, I think. If you want to read more about the Tennyson traps, here are uh, a page, and I will also put this link up in uh, the last slide as well, so. First tenet, understandable. Uh, we all like to understand uh, things, right? So a UI is understandable when the user is aware of the actions they can take um, because you have uh, concepts in your UI that they will understand immediately so they know that if they press download they will actually get the file, right? Understandable is the tenant that has the most traps. So this is where we can go <laughs> the most wrong, I would say. Uh, I will show you five of these. And the first one out here is invisible element. This is where there is no perceptible way for the user to actually see or get to a given goal because there is no icon in the UI. It's completely um, invisible. Effectively invisible is when you actually have a button or icon in the UI, but the user doesn't act on it. So it's visible but it's invisible to the user, right? We also have everything that can steal our uh, attention, namely distraction. This is something that we are not good at handling, at least not I am not that good at that. So memory challenge is another, another one here, and that is when the, user, when the user is forced to remember either a lot amount of data or something that is difficult for them to remember and I will give you examples of these as well. And the last trap here is for syntax, and this is something that will become more and more common um, nowadays when we have uh, voice user interfaces and things like that. This is basically when the user is forced to speak in a, in a way or a type that is not natural for them, that, not feel, that doesn't feel natural to them. Show of hands, how many have ever ran into a dumb user? <laughs> yeah, that's 90%. Yeah, that is, that is a trick question. I raised my hand as well, but 
we shouldn't be so quick to judge our us users. They have not yet learned the way you want them to, to navigate your app, I would say. And yes, I am also guilty of calling the users dumb, but it might be that they have yet to learn your, your system, actually. Okay, there is some dumb users, of course, but don't quote me on that. This is recorded, right? <laughs> there is no dumb users. <laughs> Well, actually, I, I do have a, um, a story about that. My mom, she is, uh, like I said, the best tester, but she is the best tester for a reason. She is as untechnical as they come. I am not even kidding. She is so untechnical that, just to set the bar here, um, when she had XP, Windows XP, uh, she, um, <laughs> my brother, I, I should start with him as well, my brother, he is as technical as they come. He is much younger than me. He is born into this computerized world. He, I don't know how he is this technical, but he is super technical, okay? So he is the one who lives closest to my mom, and he's the one who goes and, and updates her computer and makes sure everything runs good and, and stuff like that and install all her games because that is what she did on, on her computer. The only thing she did on her computer when she had XP was play games. You know, all those hide and seek games and, and small games like that. She loved it. But one day, my brother was there doing the updates. He had to do those manually back then. And there was this feature in Windows XP where you could change the color. You had three color choices. Three. So for the young in the audience, we only had three choices. We had blue, we had an olive green, and we had a chrome, a dark chrome. So my brother decided that the blue clashed with her cur curtains or something, I don't know, but he changed it to the green. Looks more beautiful, he thought. And he fixed it and he went away and my mom calls me basically hysterical. And she says that he probably had reformatted the computer. She picked up that word. <laughs> yeah, so she knew what that means. That means file new. And she said, could you help me install all my games again? Because he didn't do that and I'm saying, I, I don't believe that he would format your computer and not install your games because that is the sole purpose of this computer's existence, playing games, right? So, well, no, 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 they're not there, but just look, okay, so maybe he removed them from, from the desktop. He likes a clean desktop. So look in, in the file menu and, and stuff, but he, she could not find them. So I remote in and I go to the desktop and there they are, every single game. And I told her, they're right there on the desktop. No, nope. no, nope. they're not. He removed them. Can you install them? But they are right there on the desktop. And I even circled it like this with a, with a mouse pointer. And, and she's like, nope. But they're green. Oh, oh, there they are. But they were green. So that's how untechnical my mom is, just to set the bar here. So fast forward. She goes from um, Windows XP, we felt sorry for her, so we bought her a uh, uh, Windows 8 um, laptop. That step between Windows XP and Windows 8 for a non-technical person, yeah. I was expecting a ton of calls, support calls. You know the calls, but there was none. So I just figured that she didn't use her, her laptop, right? But then it turns out she did. So somehow she managed to use uh, Windows, but then again, she's only using it for, for, uh, for games, so maybe that wasn't the deal or the issue. So my brother, he uh, buys her a new router, her old one uh, burnt out or something, and he comes over and is uh, going to install it for her. And she's starting to be become a little bit curious about how everything is working and, and, and computers and all that. So she was following him around like, oh, okay, so you're connecting the cable over there. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And you're doing this here. Is that the internet coming in from that cord? And she was a little bit uh, interested. And, and then he says, okay, you can go and drink coffee now and, and, and something because uh, this next part you will only have to do once and it's super complicated and you don't have to, to worry about that, okay? And she's like, but I wanna, I wanna know how it works, okay? And she's like, no, no, no. Microsoft has ruined Windows with Windows 8. They ruined it. He was ruthless. She's like, but what? Well, they have hidden 
all the settings, Sing every single one of them. It is so complicated to find these things. And she's like, what things? Well, I have to put in all the network settings and then the password and all that. And she's like, well, you mean like this? And she swiped from the right to get this invisible charms bar and she pressed on settings and there it was. The super difficult to find network settings that Microsoft has ruined. So how is it that my super untechnical mom could find this, but my very, very technical brother, who has had Windows since Windows X something, could not? Interesting, huh? So let's look at it. There are two factors to our, our, um, that affects our attention. We have the user's goals and expectations, what they expect to find. And we also have the visual display of information and, and choices in, in the UI. So what happened here was there was no indicator that he could use this invisible charms bar. There was no other way to find it than to swipe or you could click as well, but that was it. My brother didn't expect to find it there because for years he had found it in a different way, right? He didn't use the charms bar that much, obviously, because then he would have known that it was there. So there was no habit of going into that uh, charms bar. And also, this was something completely new in Windows with Windows 8. So he had no prior knowledge of this in the previous versions. So if we were to analyze this, uh, like with the tenets and traps cards, we would have listened for things that my brother said. If we retract all the uh, swear words, of course, uh, it would be, I can't find it or I can't see it. Uh, I don't know where to click. So I can't see it will then translate to an invisible element. And because he couldn't see it, it didn't make any sense to him. That's, that is why Microsoft actually ruined Windows 8. He can find it now though. I still find it funny that my untechnical mother just owned my technical brother in, in network settings, so that's a great story. Don't get me wrong, invisible can be really good. I love keyboard shortcuts. I live for them. Well, not completely, but I love them. But there has to be another way in the UI to perform that task. Otherwise, there will be people like my brother saying that you ruined something, and that's not good. Speaking of invisible elements, for those of you who cannot read the text, it says, type the text you see here. Do you see the text? No. I teach at a school that uses a learning management system, and this is how it used to look. Uh, how do I write an email? Of course, I press the leaf up here. <laughs> I don't know if they are trying to convey that electrical emails are more, I don't know good for the environment. They, they later actually changed it so you could um, understand what you were doing. Uh, so this is an effectively invisible element because I was looking for a pen or a star or a new or something, so I was not looking for a leaf. Uh, so this is effectively invisible. A UI that suddenly appears, like uh, all these we have uh, down here, um, can distract, distract the users from their goal. Uh, I'm very easily distracted. Um, remember all the pop-ups we used to have in Windows that even sounded like uh, a balloon popping? Yeah, prime example of, of distractions. Uh, not good. All the animations, um, all the pop-ups, all the notifications are distractions that will uh, steal the attention uh, from the user. Another example of distraction is this one. Why is there a gun coming in here? <laughs> this is a legitimate page. They sell cars and they do so very successfully in the UK. Oh, I love this next one. Oh, no. Here. <laughs> Granted, they are actually doing this on purpose. I do have a friend though who, um, who was, um, he has a very interesting uh, 
theory about this page. You say they are so successful because if you accidentally run into this page, you will just buy the first car and you're over and done with it so you can get out of the page. I don't know if that's true or not, hopefully not. Uh, but it's still a very good example of, uh, of distraction. I have no, car, no, no knowledge of any car that they show here. I will look at all the different other things. So Sometimes the uh, system forces the user to remember things that uh, it's easy to forget. Uh, for me, <laughs> it's passwords, um, but that's my own fault. I am the world's worst password remember. I do have a password app, doesn't help me. Uh, so I have to reset my emails or my passwords more times than I should admit, actually. Uh, but it was a funny thing, uh, I thought that this was the thing of the past, back when Yahoo was the thing, right? The Yahoo email. Uh, but I recently ran into this again. So this is when you sign up for something and you choose a password and they prompt you for, to ch choose a, a security question that they can ask you later if you forget or when I forget my password. Um, but the interesting thing about these are, this is not from, from Yahoo, but I remember that Yahoo only had like four questions to choose from. And one of them was uh, something about what state your mother was born in or something like that. We don't have states in Sweden. So that question is out of the question. Um, and there are also questions like, um, what's your favorite teacher or what's your favorite pet? How can you choose a favorite pet? <laughs> so I'm always debating, should I, should I do the, teacher, which I don't know which my favorite teacher is, I, I don't know, uh, or should I do the pet? But I love my, all my pets equally, so how do I choose? Do I, do I pick the first one or the last one? I, I don't know. So I have these, I, I'm constantly debating, which means it's very hard to me for me to, to actually even remember what question I chose. And when I, I guess right on the question, I also have to remember what pet I chose. So. I have to remember three things here. But in some cases, you have to choose three of these questions, which means you don't have that much choice, do you? You have to find those questions that are kind of a little bit off and hope that you remember whatever you put in that is not true. So this is um, definitely not something I recommend. Uh, so this is definitely a memory challenge. It would be so much easier if I just remember my password, but that is not the case. So for syntax, anybody know what this is? Amazon Alexa, if you don't want, know what that is, uh, or Amazon Echo Dot, I think is the uh, right name. Uh, Alexa actually has a, a booth over here. You can um, go in and find that out. But something that is coming more and more is voice user interfaces or even chatbots for that matter. And with that comes a little uh, forced syntax as well. And this is, uh, like I said before, when the user doesn't feel comfortable uh, or, or can speak in a natural way for them. Uh, what if I had to say, I use, uh, we use uh, Alexa and, and Google Home and all those assistant to turn on and off the lights at home, for instance. What if I had to say, Alexa, kitchen light dot state equals on? Doesn't feel that natural, does it? Well, maybe to some of you, but <laughs> still. So that is forced syntax. So the next tenet is comfortable. We all like to be comfortable, right? So a UI is comfortable when the user can perform uh, physically actions um, in, in, well, physically effortless, I should say. They can perform the actions physically effortless. Uh, this includes things like you have a bad um, choice of, of text or, or things like that. Um, they are supposed to be able to read the text error-free and, and quite quickly for them. So a UI is comfortable, uh, no, I just said that. Physical challenge is, is one of the traps here. So let's look at that. Sometimes the user knows exactly what they're supposed to do, but they are unable to do so because uh, there are physical uh, challenging. So like this poor guy, he does not want that Tinder date, but he has a very hard time swiping, right? Uh, so this is definitely a physical challenge for him to perform that task. 
but it's also if we have, imagine using this for touch or for anything for that matter. But when the buttons are too close or the touch areas are too close to each other, so you accidentally press two of them or you can't press either of them and so on, this is also a physical challenge. It can also be if you are developing for, for um, something that will mainly be shown on television screens, uh, because what they have is an is, uh, um, interesting bug, let's call it. Uh, they have something called clipping. I, I think you've probably seen sometimes the, the logo of, of um, the channel is sometimes cut. That is due to clipping. And there is no way for us as developers to know what brand or even what model will have clipping. So then you have to actually think about that and, and, and uh, move all your stuff inside the clipping plane, so to speak. But it's also this when it's hard to actually read the text due to light background and light uh, choice of, of uh, font color. Um, or when you use a too small, fine typeface that you can't read either. So this is also a physical challenge. A UI is responsive when it reacts instantly or very fast on the user's um, actions. We all like responsiveness, right? This might be the most important tenant of them all, if you ask me, uh, because I will rage quit you if you are not fast or responsive. It uh, doesn't matter how beautiful your app is or how good of a feature you have in your app, because if I feel that your app is hanging all the time, I will rage quit. I'm sorry, I, but I will. And I think I'm not alone in that. So since this is an important one, let's look at both of the traps in this tenant. Amazon and Microsoft Live Search did an um, experiment, if you will, together, uh, those two giants. They delayed the search result with one second. Not that much time. The number of questions that they were asked went down with 1%, and the ad clicks went down with 1.5%. Then they delayed it with two seconds instead. And the numbers more than doubled. It was 2.5% and 4.4% instead. And it doesn't sound like much, but if you take into account the revenue that these giants have, I mean, this is translating to millions of dollars because they have a slow application. There are two types of thresholds when it comes to response time. Uh, we have an absolute and we have a relative one. Uh, but the human threshold for detecting that time has passed is within 100 uh, milliseconds and from the user activation, I should say. And this is considered to be the gold standard, even though I know recently in Finland there was uh, a study made for um, the, the used short distance sprinters to see the reaction time from the starting gun went off and they could find that they could go down to 75 milliseconds instead, but they are still, uh, I mean, they are expecting it and they are athletes. So 100 is still the gold standard here. But it's also very difficult times to uphold that, uh, that number all the time in your application. So this is where the relative threshold comes into play. Um, okay. The difference um, has to be, for, from your competitor, for instance, the difference has to be more than 20% for us to perceive that there is a difference in speed. So this is what we, we uh, need to strive for. At least 19%, if, you all, if you're under 19%, you're fine. Otherwise, we can't really know that there are a different uh, speed, unless you put them next to each other, of course. But there you go. When the system doesn't respond or the user thinks that the system doesn't respond, this is how I react. Uh, might be just me, but this is the trap slow or non-responsive. I click hysterically. Is there anyone else who does that? Yeah? Awesome, I'm not alone. So to prevent this, we can um, have a few things in mind, uh, like provide a confirmation within 100 milliseconds of user activation that could be as simple as the button will look like you pressed it, right? Uh, that will help a lot because I know that you are doing something. 
provide a response within 500 milliseconds for task that the user perceives as easy, uh, like page down or zoom or, or um, minimize a window and things like that. Make sure that you give continuous feedback for, for processes that takes more than one second. Uh, simple animations, uh, the indicator, the, the wheelie thingy that has no numbers or, or something, but so we know that something is happening unless it's over two seconds. If they are longer than two seconds, we need to provide a progress bar or indicator that something is giving you, with information that something is happening. Because if we see this wheel for four seconds, we will think that your app is stuck, right? If you have some form of progress indicator, you should make it clear to the user that progress is being made every two to five seconds, uh, somewhere in between that. Uh, so the user knows that it's not just stuck again, right? And someone who does that really, really well is the guys from uh, Dragon Mania Legends. So if you look down here in the white box, it says things like dusting Academy Hall, uh, sewing mini Vikings and, and things like that, which has of course nothing to do what they're, <laughs> with what they're actually doing. But for the user, it makes total sense because this is what I'm doing inside the game, right? So it doesn't have to be collecting data from the database, just something that changes every two to five seconds. Also a very cute game. You know when you browse on YouTube and you look at a little bit too many kitten videos? Yeah, you know. And then all of a sudden YouTube decides that you have to watch this ad, you cannot skip it in four seconds. Yeah, and you try to get away from it and, and you back out, but then they start to new uh, advertise, or you try to click another cat video and they still force you to, to watch that. So you just have to sit there and watch it, right? This is captive wait, and it's not th something that the users like. So it's also the last trap in, in uh, responsive. Did I mention that I'm a geek? Yeah. Being efficient is also something that we as human like, uh, to do things in as few steps as possible or as fast and easy as possible. I'm also lazy. <laughs> so let's look at three of them, uh, the traps here in, in efficient. So a UI is efficient when the user perceives that it performs the actions in as, as minimal steps as possible. And the key word here is perceive. Doesn't have to be fewer steps, but it should feel like fewer steps. Usually that is actually removing steps, but not all the time. System amnesia is when the user uh, prompts for information that it has on you or, or uh, learned previously, but still all of a sudden doesn't remember. And a UI is, is predictive when uh, it automatically performs actions that uh, I, as the user, believe that is going to do uh, in, in order of my expectations, I should say. So the big challenge here is to form an accurate prediction because there are so many variables here and this is a really difficult thing to, um, to do. Uh, there are so many things that might be correct. This is what it looks like when you're buying a movie ticket in, in Sweden and this is all in Swedish, so hmm, might be something else. No, really. Um, I have just put in a prepaid ticket into the system to uh, buy, uh, we, we're going to see Avengers. And up here, it prompts me for, for uh, well, are you a robot? No, I'm not, so I have to click that. But we ordered four tickets. So four times, I had to prove that I was not a robot. <laughs> if I wasn't a robot 10 seconds ago, I probably am not a robot now, right? That's not how it works. But then <laughs> when we, uh, we were going to see Star Wars, the last Star Wars movie, we were 18 friends and we all had prepaid tickets. So 18 times I was not a robot. I'm really sure I'm not a robot. Or I'm a robot that knows how to click on that button, I don't know. Took some time though. So this is definitely an unnecessary step. They could instead just put it in the last step and are you sure you're not a robot? Well, no. So this is from uh, Xbox One and when uh, it recently had came out 
Uh, we actually had two Xbox One by this time. Uh, you need to have one in, in, in your office, right? And then you need to have one you're playing games on. But when I go into Xbox.com, uh, they say, oh, did you get an Xbox One? And then they also say, oh, look at this Halo game. It's amazing. And now we look down here. My recent activity is playing Halo on Xbox One. So why are they wasting those two, I imagine very expensive, front and center ad spaces and trying to sell me another version of that? So this is system amnesia. All of a sudden it doesn't remember. Clearly it remembered down here. But I'm kind of happy as well because I forget stuff all the time. And at least I know the computers can do that as well. Autocorrect. You know what that is? Of course you do. Every single one of you. I recently became a victim of this. Uh, I do a lot of um, events. I organize hackathons. I organize meetups and, and what have you. And I also have a, a few friends that is uh, DevOps. Usually I'm, I'm into developer things and stuff like that. But I, I um, had helped out in a few DevOps events. So, and this, if, if you're wondering, this is actually a real text. We are this nerdy. So I typed that Deadpool is the best superhero, but Spider-Man will always have a special place in my heart because he was my first uh, actual comic book. And, and uh, since my husband is in the room, I have to say that Batman was also one of those. We have a fight, Marvel versus DC, so yeah. So I can sleep in the bed tonight. So what happened is I swiped Deadpool, but it corrected to DevOps. <laughs> yeah. You think my DevOps friend has fun with this? So I had to go back to dev only events. Yeah, you understand. So, so this is a bad prediction, a really bad prediction. Bad prediction. Forgiving. This is uh, perhaps one of the easiest tenets of them all. There is such thing as an easy tenet. Um, a UI is forgiven, forgiving when you can undo a mistake. We all make mistakes, mistakes right? This is a really, really good example. Word. You can write a freaking book and undo basically to a white, uh, empty um, sheet of paper, right? So this is really, really good. Uh, Control Z is uh, one of my favorites uh, <laughs> keyboard shortcuts. You have probably also filled in um, forms on the internet. And if you're like me, you realize two pages in that, oh, I should have used my spam e email. You know that email that you use for signing up for crap? Yeah. And then you go back and poof, everything is gone. There is no undo. Because if you, put, if you press forward again, they won't magically fill in everything you did. So this is where I rage quit again. I rage quit a lot. <laughs> I don't know, I'm bad like that. So the trap here is irreversible action. There is no way I can undo the undo, so to speak, in, in when we're talking about the forms. Next tenet is discrete. Discrete is good. Uh, this is when the user can go about their business in a social context without embarrassment or awkward situations, either for them or the people around them. Like when you uh, have, uh, you remember when you had autoplay on videos for Instagram and you forget when you have, uh, if, if you have your, your um, earphone, headphones in and all of a sudden the whole subway can hear your videos, right? That is not being discreet. And another good example is um, if you go to the ATM and it would read out loud your code. No. Not good. Actually, I, uh, <laughs> there is an incident in Sweden many, many years ago where, where you had um, uh, an accessibility thing for, for blind people and they actually told you what you pressed. So everybody would know how much money you actually withdraw and that's, that's not good. That's not good. But it can also be the games that floods Facebook. Yeah, we all hate those. Uh, remember when Spotify was connected to Facebook? Yeah. Every single song, every single friend who had Spotify was listed in Facebook. You could see nothing 
There was no images of whatever you had for lunch. There was only songs. Uh, so this is definitely not discreet. Or <laughs> actually at home, when we're speaking about face Facebook, we have to um, sneak Facebook during uh, the month of December and, and February. Because December we have Christmas, and my birthday is in January, and Jimmy's birthday is in, in February. So, so it's basically, what are you doing? Nothing. I'm not on Facebook. Uh, because no, n none of us are smart enough to, every year, when we do the first initial search for, for whatever we are going to buy, to do that in an in private browser or, or an incognito window. Every single year, we're flooded with, with information on Facebook. So I, last year, I had all Facebook full of drones. So there was no way I could actually use Facebook in front of Jimmy. So it's, uh, yeah. All of this is unwanted disclosure. We don't want to see all that information, right? The UI is protective when the user doesn't lose their data unintentionally. And like I said, I organize a lot of uh, events like hackathons and stuff. And when we do that, we, we get sponsor, sponsor money and we want to stretch that uh, to be able to do as many hackathons as possible. So we do a lot of things manually. We go shopping manually or by ourselves. So us this one time, we, um, we had been up very, very late the Friday before. And the hackathon, we had put nine in the morning on a Saturday for some reason. I don't know what we were thinking. Uh, but nine in the morning, let's start coding. Uh, on a Saturday, so we went to the supermarket just before, and the guy who was driving, he, he was kind of late, so we were already starting off kind of badly. And we come to the shop, and when you're doing a hackathon for well, like 100 people, you need a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. There's a, I think we bought over 200 energy drinks and over 400 sodas, and there was snacks, and there was everything. Because you need a lot of an in energy to, to uh, do awesome apps, right? So in Sweden, we have um, uh, scanners for, for self-checkout. And it's not like you go by and then you scan it in, in, in the, in like the, in the cashier. You have the actual scanner in your hand, and you, you scan it, and you put it in the bag, and you scan and put it in the bag, and so on. So we did that a lot of times and when we were almost finished and I was so so stressed out because the time was running out it was like 40 minutes before it was going to start and we live a little bit outside of, of, of the city center so it took maybe takes like 25 30 minutes to drive uh, so I was in a hurry now I don't want to be late for my own hackathon right that would be embarrassing and all of a sudden my scanner goes black and I see before me what I have to do. I have to put every single energy drink up on a conveyor belt and, and the cashier have to scan it. So by this I can, do, I can really feel the adrenaline and I, I can't form real sentences. So I take my scanner and I go to the cashier and I'm like, ah! <laughs> that, that's basically what I said. For some reason she understood. And she took my scanner and she gave me a new one and I was like, oh, do I have to rescan everything? Two seconds later, I have everything I need. It just said, welcome, Jessica, and there was my uh, whole shopping done. That is protective, and this is what we want to strive for, right? So I, I made it on time, barely, but I made it. So having to click save to commit something uh, is kind of redundant today. And this is something that came from back when, when memory and storage was really, really expensive, which it isn't anymore. Uh, so actually prompting to do that is most of the times unnecessary. And the funny thing is with this meme, my friend the other day told me exactly this story and he hadn't seen this. And I was like, are you for real? So yeah, that is the thing. This is how old I am. This is how old I am. And the trap here is data loss. As humans, we cannot help but to be protective, oh no, learn habits, I should say. It's hardwired into us. We, we learn this from a very small, very young age. And this is something that is often overlooked when it comes to uh, user interfaces, which we should use more. We can, we can use that. 
So a UI is habituating when over time the user knows exactly what to do and it does, they do not do it completely automatic uh, without even thinking. This will lead to more efficiency and more understanding as well. We will talk about three traps here. The visual appearance in, in, um, for a given action, for one single action, if that appearance actually changed throughout the UI, uh, we have an inconsistent appearance. A UI has a single home when there is one conceptual way uh, or place that the user can perceive as a starting point of the app. And we have uh, the last one. A UI is non-redundant when there is one single way in the interface to perform a given task. So to create new can look a little bit different depending on what we are, where we are. In, in uh, Canvas, the one I showed you before, it's a leaf. Uh, but we have a plus, we have a pen, we have everything, and, and this is definitely uh, an inconsistent appearance, which means that we have to take that little extra second to think about what we're looking for. Show of hands, who knows Facebook? No, I'm kidding, of course you know about what Facebook is. Uh, the two main things you do on Facebook, what is that? Post things and, and keep uh, contacting people, right? Keep in contact. And what you had for dinner, you have to show as well, right? So let's look at uh, keeping contact part, or, or namely um, IM, instant messaging. How many ways can you start an IM? Well, this is just a couple of them. There are, I think last time I counted 10 or 12 different ways to start an IM on Facebook, uh, which is, a problem if someone asks you how, how to start an IM or, or if they have um, issues when they are chatting because you are somewhere else in the UI and, and so on. But that's not the only reason it's a problem. It's also a problem because when we are presented with 10 different ways to do a thing, we will have to analyze that however quickly, but we do have to think about what choice we have and, and that will take longer time, which means that we will feel that, I will feel that Facebook is so much slower to uh, send an IM than for, for instance Skype or something else. So this is uh, called a gratuitous redundancy. There are too many ways to do a certain thing. This is another example of that trap. I want to go to the room 3,600. Do I go right or left or a little more to the left? I don't know. So this is definitely also a gratuitous redundancy. We all feel a little better when we have a sense of home, right? And you can find your way around. And this is also true for a UI. A UI will have a sense of home when you have a starting point to, to um, regroup, if you will, or start a new task and things like that. And the user can get slower or at least perceive your app as slower if there is no single starting point. If we don't have a starting point or, or a sense of home, we will have an ambiguous home instead, and that is exactly what it sounds like, where there is no single place where I can regroup and start over. Uh, anybody have the Xbox 360 back in the day? Yeah? Uh, there was an issue with that. We had an ambiguous home there. We had one home when we pressed the large Xbox button that went to the dashboard, but we also had a, a home when we pressed the little info button. Uh, we got a, a start menu of sorts as well. So some things, we didn't know exactly where to look for them. So, so that was definitely um, an ambiguous home. But it's also the other way around. So this is uh, from Xbox One when Netflix got released. Um, what category do I put Netflix in on the Xbox? Is it apps? Is it children? Is it entertainment? Is it movies? Is it, is it serious? Well, they put them in all of them, which means we don't know exactly where to go. We will, we will find it anywhere, but since that they have actually uh, changed it. So this definitely didn't have a sense of home, so it was an ambiguous home here. So this is the last tenet and the last trap. It only has one trap, beautiful. And although it sounds obvious that a beautiful UI will, will appeal to the user, uh, there is very little to be, <laughs> be said about what exactly is beautiful uh, because it's very individual. 
So this trap isn't about the latest new trend. This is about looking professional, for instance. Um, when apps are clearly made for another platform, like when you have a, a UI but back button in uh, an Android or Windows phone app, you know that this is off. You might not know why, but it, it's off because we have a hardware button for back. Uh, then this trap will, will come in. Uh, but this is also another, no, no? Show of hands, who would want to put in their credit card in this machine? No? No daredevils? No, me neither. So what's happening here is the boxes are not aligned. Well, nothing is basically aligned to, to anything. It doesn't look professional at all. Uh, the handwritten notes, well, it doesn't really improve the, the seriousness of this app, right? Uh, <laughs> therefore, this will go into unattractive appearance. Uh, this is what we are talking about when we're talking about beautiful. It should only look professional, uh, all the other things we can think about later, right? Uh, another thing is uh, also if you are not utilizing the different platform design languages that is, exist. So if you're, um, uh, Google has material design, Microsoft has Microsoft, Microsoft design language or Fluent now or, or um, human interface design for, for Apple. Um, if you give them a read through and utilizes what they are, are talking about, you will have a little bit more beautiful or, or uh, you will fit in to the platform better and we will um, like that even more. So today we are living in, in a world where internet is getting faster and faster by the minute. We have apps uh, and services released basically every single second now. And the vast amount of apps that is, is uh, coming out is piling up in a really, really fast pace as well. And we also are thinking more and more about being inclusive and, and, and about diversity in real life when we can also do so in the UX. But this means all of these things together means that UX will become so much more important that, than ever from now on. Uh, because if your app or page is a little slow or a little bit more complicated than your competitor, you don't have a good experience for the user. We will actually lose your credibility. You will lose your user and you will lose money. And that is not a good thing. So try not to get lost in that next release you're working on or in your vast, massive backlog. Everything we are developing, we are developing for the users. So I will leave you with, be like Tron. He fights for the users. Thank you.